Takes a lot of right stuff to fly like that. Hello, fellow pilots, I'm John King. And I'm Martha King. You know, whether you fly F-16s, Cessnas, or a venerable Cherokee, there are concepts, principles, and just plain old rules of thumb that apply to all safe flying. Over the past several years, Martha and I have presented tips for pilots on ABC's Wide World of Flying. We've covered such subjects as correcting for crosswinds on landings, how to calculate a rate of descent, what you should know about fuel contamination, and if you're new to the art of tail dragging, what you should know before you attempt your first takeoff and landing in a tail dragger. Like how to keep the tail behind the nose where it belongs. We've put all these timely tips together in a program we call The Right Stuff. Even though aircraft and instruments continue to get more sophisticated, there's some things about flying that will probably never change. The information in these tips will serve you for years to come. Now let's join Martha as she leads off with a segment about landings and approaches, including crosswind landings and runway illusions. Take a look at this particular runway. This runway seems to be a relatively short runway. Now take a look at this runway. This one seems to be quite a bit longer. The interesting thing is that these two runways are parallel runways and they're exactly the same length. Both of these runways are exactly 3,400 feet long. We're used to a certain relationship between the runway width and the length of the runway. Our mind holds a picture of what we consider to be normal. The left runway here is slightly narrower than usual. It's only 60 feet wide. Because it is narrow, it appears to be longer to the pilot. It also tends to make the pilot think he's coming in too high on approach, which can result in the pilot overcorrecting, flying a too low approach with a risk of striking obstructions or landing short. Now, the right runway is unusually wide for a general aviation runway, at least for one that's only 3,400 feet long. This runway is 150 feet wide. Because it's wider than we expect for its length, it tends to look short to the pilot. It also tends to make the pilot think that he's coming in too low, which can result in a too high approach with the risk of overshooting the runway or of leveling out high and landing hard. Learning the runway width at your destination airport when you do your pre-flight planning can really help you fly a better approach. Night flying can be absolutely beautiful, and it offers the benefits that airports and traffic can be easier to spot at night, and the night air is often smoother. In fact, it's been said that flying at night is exactly like flying during the day, except you can't see as much. Well, hello, fellow pilots. I'm John King of King School. Here's a tip from our newest takeoff video, Night Flying, that will help you enjoy the added utility and beauty that night flying can offer. You know, the fact that you can't see as much at night does become a problem when you're making what is known as a black hole approach over water or dark terrain on a moonless or a cloudy night. And the trick is to learn to get the most out of the few remaining clues that are available at night. We all know a VASI can be a great help for glide path control at night if it's available. But here's how you can make safe approaches when a VASI is not available at night. Now, when the aircraft appears to be on the proper glide path, establish a standard three degree angle of descent. To determine this for your airplane, multiply your ground speed in knots times five. If you have an 80 knot ground speed, your rate of descent should be about 400 feet a minute. Now, when you're on that proper glide path, the landing spot should stay in the same position on the windshield without moving up or down. And other objects should appear to move away from the landing spot. Everything beyond the landing spot should appear to move up the windshield. And things closer to the landing spot should move down the windshield. And at the same time, the runway should gradually occupy a greater and greater portion of the pilot's field of vision. Also, at a constant approach angle, the relative shape of the runway shouldn't change. But if you're getting low, on the other hand, the runway appears to get shorter. And when you're getting higher, the runway appears to get longer. Practicing awareness of these clues just might come in handy some night at a dark and lonely airport 
Here's a tip from one of our takeoff videos, practical piloting, that just may keep you from going off the end of the runway on some dark and rainy night. You know, the most common mistake pilots make on landing is flying too fast on final. They add a few knots for the bumps, and then maybe add a few knots for a strange airport. Then they get carried away and add a few knots maybe for the dark. <laughs> well, you can see the results in bounce landings, broken nose wheels, bald tires, <laughs> and sometimes and even running off the end of the runway. Well, the fact is, just a 10% increase in your landing speed results in a 20% increase in your landing distance. <laughs> Add a tailwind and you could be in real trouble. A tailwind of 10% of your landing speed results in another 20% increase in your landing distance. In other matters, make things even worse. A slick or wet runway will increase the landing distance by 50% or more. And a slope will increase the landing distance by 10% for each 2 degrees or 4% of slope. You fly too high in approach speed and then add some of these adverse conditions and you could find an airplane that normally lands in about 1,000 feet of runway now requires 3,000 feet of runway or more. So the key is fly the proper speed on final. And don't forget to reduce that speed by 5% for each 10% reduction in gross weight. Doing this just could save you from an embarrassing walk back to the runway on some dark and rainy night. A strong headwind on final could, if you're not careful, turn your normal approach into something resembling a low-level strafing run to the airport. Here's why. The FAA standard for the angle of descent on final approach is three degrees. Most visual approach slope indicators, VASIs, provide a three-degree angle of descent. And so do most ILS glide slopes. In a familiar airplane, pilots usually know what rate of descent in feet per minute is required to maintain the standard glide path to the airport at the normal approach speed. Notice on this instrument approach chart that at 90 knots ground speed, your rate of descent should be just over 450 feet per minute. But a strong headwind on final will greatly reduce the rate of descent required for a normal glide path with a 20 knot headwind. This same airplane would only have a ground speed of 70 knots on final and the correct rate of descent would be just over 350 feet per minute. With a strong headwind on final, maintaining the power setting and configuration for your usual rate of descent could cause you to become dangerously low, particularly if the airport does not have a VASI or a glide slope. Here's a quick rule of thumb that will help you avoid that predicament. To estimate the standard rate of descent in feet per minute, multiply your ground speed in knots by five. If due to a strong headwind, your ground speed on final today is only 50 knots, then a 250 feet per minute rate of descent will give you the standard glide path and keep you from flying a low, flat approach. Keeping this rule of thumb stored in mind could help you avoid that low-level strafing run to the airport on some windy day. What we're going to do is get the airplane somewhere between, we'll say, a foot and a half to five feet off the runway, pull it off, and fly the whole length of the runway without touching down. Now, what I'm going to demonstrate by doing this is how you correct for a crosswind on landing. We're going to have a little crosswind from the left, and the way you correct for a crosswind is you bank the airplane, and as you bank the wings of the airplane, the aircraft will start drifting across the runway. In other words, if I bank the airplane to the left, the airplane will drift across the runway to the left. If I bank the airplane to the right, the airplane will drift across the runway to the right. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this banking of the airplane to drift the aircraft left and right. Now, unless you made an active attempt to keep the airplane uh, longitudinal axis pointed right down the runway, in other words, keep the nose going right down the center line of the runway, by using rudder pressure, the airplane is going to yaw left and right. So I'm also actively going to have to use rudder pressure to keep the airplane from yawing to the left and to the right. And this is exactly how you make a crosswind landing, but not touching down and flying the whole length of the runway will demonstrate that very well. Now, people ask on a crosswind landing, how much bank angle do you use? The answer is enough to keep it from drifting left or right. How much rudder do you use? Just enough to keep it pointed right down the runway. 
Okay, now we're over the runway. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to establish my flare and hold it off the runway. Now, watch it drift to the left when I bank to the left. The airplane drifts all the way to the left. Now let's bank to the right and watch the airplane drift back to the right. Watch it drift all the way across to the right. See it drifting across to the right? That's because I'm banked to the right. Now let's do it again to the left. We're going to drift all the way across the runway to the left. And it's the bank that makes it drift over there. See it drifting across? Isn't that, isn't that something? Okay, now we'll drift back to the right. Then we'll put it right back on center line by banking. There we are on center line the whole time. Now, watch if I push right rudder, the nose yaws to the right. Left rudder, no yaws to the left. And so you use rudder to keep the nose aligned with the runway like so. Let's go around. How about that, sports fans? Hello, fellow pilots. I'm John King of King Schools. Most of us consistently make pretty good landings. And if an occasional landing turns out to be a firm one, you can always say you were making a short field landing and you intended it to be a firm one. But every now and then, we make a landing so hard that we think the airplane ought to be inspected afterwards. I made one landing so hard, the glass fell out of the Hobbs meter. <laughs> this will probably never happen to you. But if ever you do feel the need to look over an airplane for damage, it would be a good idea to know what to look for. Now, of course, if you feel that a structure has been overstressed, the very best thing to do would be to have a licensed airframe mechanic inspect the aircraft. But what if you're in a remote area and no mechanic is available? Well, here are a few tips from the airframe course of our new Aviation Mechanic Written Exam Series that might be helpful. Landing damage usually is not this obvious. Generally, if a riveted structure has been overstressed, you can expect to see more subtle visual indications in the airframe. Look for wrinkles or bulges in the skin of the aircraft, particularly around the landing gear. Sometimes the entire airframe can be warped. Notice that the paint marks don't match up with this door. That's because the entire door frame is warped by a hard landing. Now, rivets are designed for shear or sideways loads rather than tension loads, which tend to pull them apart. And it's shear loads that cause the most rivet failures. One sign that a wing assembly has been critically loaded is known as rivet tipping. Look for consecutive rivets all tipped in the same direction. On bonded fiberglass or honeycomb structures, a simple test for delamination is what is known as the ring test or the tap test. Now, all you need is a coin or a washer. Now, when you tap the structure, you should hear a clear ringing sound. A dull thud indicates separation of the layups. <laughs> well, let's hope you never make a landing hard enough to require a structural inspection. So with this information, you now know how to recognize the results of someone else's hard landing. These days, few of us get the enjoyable, if sometimes not accidentally exhilarating experience of taking off and landing a tail dragger. It certainly takes some getting used to to keep the tail from catching up to you and sometimes even passing you. Let's join Martha as she gives us some pointers on keeping that tail where it belongs. Now for those of you who are flying tail draggers, let's see if we can give you some tips on keeping the tail behind the nose where it belongs. Now there's a number of reasons that a tailwheel airplane is less stable on the ground than a nosewheel airplane is. For one thing, a tailwheel airplane has more surface area behind the main wheels than a nosewheel airplane does. This means it's more affected by the wind and has a stronger tendency to weather vane into the wind. Also, the main wheels are in front of the center of gravity. And since the airplane pivots around the main wheels on the ground, this means that on the ground, if the airplane starts turning, the weight swinging around the main wheels tends to tighten up the turn. These characteristics make a tail dragger unstable on the ground. And what that means to you, the pilot, is that you have to be quicker on the rudders. Don't let the airplane even get started turning on the runway. And if there's any crosswind at all, you've got to use your very best crosswind takeoff and landing technique. On the landing, because the main wheels are in front of the center of gravity, when the mains make contact with the runway, the airplane tends to pitch back up into the air. Let's watch a takeoff now. On the takeoff, 
align the airplane with the runway center line and make sure that tail wheel is centered. Smoothly advance your throttle to full power and scan your engine instruments. Now the tail will rise slightly of its own accord. If you raise the tail by pushing forward on the elevator control, you can lift the tail off the ground prematurely, which can lead to erratic pitch changes and directional problems. As you near takeoff speed, you'll be using slight back pressure to maintain this climb attitude, this slightly tail low climb attitude. It's the same climb attitude that you rotate to for takeoff in a nose wheel airplane. Use rudder promptly and smoothly as necessary to maintain directional control. And the airplane will fly off the runway in a slightly tail low attitude. From then on, it's just like a normal takeoff. A tail dragger landing is where things really get interesting, trying to keep that tail behind the nose where it really belongs. Remember that when you land, the fact that the main wheels are in front of the center of gravity will tend to pitch the airplane back into the air. Also, any turn that gets started on the runway will tend to tighten itself up rather than straighten itself out as in a nose wheel airplane. If there's any crosswind at all, remember to use your very best crosswind landing technique. Align the airplane with the center line of the runway. Before touchdown, flare to your landing attitude. Now, touchdown should be on the mains and tail wheel at the same time. This is a three-point landing and then a tail dragger that's desirable. This full stall landing keeps the airplane from pitching up and becoming airborne again. Ease back on the elevator to keep the tail wheel on the ground. If the tail wheel is not on the ground, easing back on the elevator control can cause the airplane to become airborne again. And keep the airplane straight using rudder and tail wheel steering. Pay close attention to directional control as the airplane slows down. You'll still be moving when the rudder starts losing its effectiveness, and it's easy for the airplane to start swerving at this point. One of the most dangerous times for directional control in a tail dragger is when it has almost but not quite come to a stop. A wheel landing can be used for landing in strong or gusty wind conditions. The airplane is actually flown into the ground. Use the same pitch attitude as for a normal approach airspeed plus about five knots. And hold the airplane in level flight attitude just off the runway until the main wheels touch then immediately add enough forward elevator to keep the main wheels on the ground and retard the throttle. As the plane slows, keep the tail up with forward elevator as long as the elevator control is effective. And when the tail falls, then hold back elevator to keep the tail on the ground. And keep the airplane straight using rudder and tail wheel steering. And remember, you're never done flying a tail dragger until it's parked in your tie-down spot. In this next segment, we're going to cover such topics as choosing an alternate airport, recognizing military training routes, and understanding what the temperature dew point spread means to you. We call this segment, Flying Smart. Most of us wonder from time to time whether our airplane has a built-in headwind. Well, you can quit wondering. Overall, it does. Here's why. First of all, over a round trip, any wind always slows you down. Assume you have a 100 knot airplane and are making a 200 nautical mile round trip, 100 nautical miles each way. Well, if there were no wind, the trip would take two hours. But now, let's assume a 50 knot tailwind on the way out and a 50 knot headwind on the way back. Well, on the way out, with a 50 knot tailwind, your ground speed will be 150 knots and that leg will take 40 minutes. But on the return leg, with a 50 knot headwind, your ground speed is only 50 knots and that leg will take two hours. The total round trip time will take two hours and 40 minutes because you spend longer flying into the headwind than you do flying with the benefit of the tailwind. Now, if the wind is 90 degrees off your course, it'll still slow you down. That's because some of the energy of your airplane is spent flying sideways to counter the effect of the wind. Even a wind that comes from slightly behind your aircraft will slow you down because of this effect. 
These ground speed arcs on the wind side of the computer demonstrate this by curving behind the airplane. Now for a 100 knot airplane, any wind dot that falls in front of the 100 knot arc will decrease your ground speed. The stronger the wind and the slower your airplane, the more you'll be affected. So if you're about to make a familiar round trip and any wind is forecast, it'd be a good idea to refigure your fuel needs. Otherwise, that built-in headwind just might cause you to walk those last few miles to the airport. Most of us fly airplanes to go fast. That's why it's difficult to make ourselves slow down, even when flying slow has advantages. Now, one time slowing down makes sense is in turbulence. Cutting your airspeed in half reduces the impact from jolts from turbulence to one quarter of what they were before. Turn radius is also dependent on airspeed. Cutting the airspeed in half reduces the turn radius to a quarter of what it was at the higher speed. Now, when you're flying in marginal visibility or in the mountains, this means you can maneuver in one quarter of the space. So as much as we'd all like to go fast, here are a couple of cases where taking decisive action to slow the airplane down just could make the trip a lot safer and a lot more comfortable. The FAA encourages pilots to make traffic advisory position reports at uncontrolled airports, and nearly all of us do. But these reports don't do any good at all if they're made on the wrong frequency. Now, the FAA specifies a common traffic advisory frequency for each uncontrolled airport. Of course, you can look up the frequency in the airport facility directory or on an IFR chart. But if you don't have either of these handy, it would be helpful to know the method the FAA uses to designate the common traffic advisory frequency for an uncontrolled airport. Here's how to know what frequency to use. If the airport has a control tower and the control tower is not in operation, then you'd use the control tower frequency to make position reports. Now, if there's a flight service station on field, the flight service station will answer on the control tower frequency to tell you about any traffic they know of. Now, if there is no control tower at all on the field, but there still is a flight service station on field, you'd make your position reports on frequency 123.6. Now, if there's no control tower or flight service station on field, but there is a Unicom, use the Unicom frequency. And if there's no control tower, no flight service station, or Unicom, then you'd use the frequency 122.9. With this information, you'll have one more tool to avoid that spinner-to-spinner -spinner encounter at an unfamiliar airport someday. In a busy terminal area, having a rule of thumb ready for planning descents in your airplane can prove to be very handy. Here's a case in point. Let's assume you're crossing the Julian Vortec at 10,500 feet and you're en route to Montgomery Field in San Diego and you want to avoid the San Diego TCA. You'll be flying out the Julian 210 degree radial and it's 25 nautical miles to the edge of the TCA. At this point, you must be below 4,800 feet and you'd like to be at 4,500. Here's a quick rule of thumb you can use to tell when you need to start down. Let's assume you'll be doing 180 knots ground speed on your descent. That's covering three nautical miles per minute. If you use a 1,000 feet per minute descent with some power in to avoid shock cooling your engine, then you'll be covering three miles forward for every 1,000 feet of descent. That gives you a descent ratio of three to one. To know when to start descent, just multiply the altitude to be lost in thousands by three. In this case, you need to lose 6,000 feet. This means you must start down 18 nautical miles from the edge of the TCA, or seven miles past Julian. You can use this same rule of thumb to check your progress during the descent and adjust your rate of descent if needed. Figuring the descent ratio for your airplane in advance will help keep you safe and your engine healthy the next time you need to avoid a busy TCA. On a non-precision approach, one without a glide slope, an early descent from your minimum descent altitude after reaching visual conditions could land you in the trees, particularly at night or in low visibility. On many approach charts, a visual descent point has been added. 
waiting until you reach this VDP before you start your descent from your minimum descent altitude guarantees you obstruction clearance and normally gives you the same three degree angle of descent as a standard ILS glide slope. The VDP is shown by a heavy V in the profile view as on this VOR approach to Elkhart, Indiana. It is usually identified as here by a DME reading. Use of the VDP is optional, but if your aircraft has the navigation equipment to identify the visual descent point, the FAA strongly recommends that you do wait until reaching the VDP before starting your descent. Using the VDP should help you stay out of those trees. Now that it's summer, many of us are making plans for a flying vacation. One of the greatest thrills of flying is taking an airplane to a new and different place and seeing the countryside in a way that otherwise just wouldn't be possible. But along with this excitement of going someplace new, comes the need to become familiar with that new airspace you'll be flying in. John King will explain how your familiarity with military training routes and how they are numbered will help you avoid an unexpected close encounter with a low altitude, high speed military jet. Now another thing as a pilot you'll want to know about is when you might see jets like these flying at very low altitudes and at very high speeds, and you're going to find that out by looking on the chart and noticing military training routes. So let's take a look at military training routes. Military training routes are routes on the chart that are shown with letters either VR in a number or IR in a number, and here they are. There's these gray or black lines going across the uh, chart like so. And this is in the Palm Springs area south of Chiraco Summit, and there's a heck of a lot of them here. Now, what are military training routes? These are routes where the military has permission to fly near the ground at speeds more than 250 knots indicated airspeed. They fly terrain following routes at altitudes sometimes two to 300 feet above the ground. And so you blunder in an area like this without knowing it, and you're Cessna 150, and that scares the daylights out of you. So these are called military training routes. Now, non-participating aircraft are not prohibited from flying within a military training route. However, the FAA suggests that you use extreme vigilance. That means look outside the window when you're flying near these routes. If you want to find out what's going on in a military training route, you can call a flight service station uh, within 100 nautical miles of the route of flight and give them your position, your route of flight, and your destination, and they'll check to see which military, tra military training routes are active, and they'll let you know about them and let you know how wide they are. These military training routes are a different width, so you call the flight service station and you're going to find out about it. Now, when you're requesting the information, make sure you do give them your position, your route of flight and destination. That way they can tell you about the routes that are going to be active. They'll check to see if they're going to be active. Now, you can learn a little bit about these routes by knowing about the numbering system. If the route starts with the letters VR, that means the route is restricted to visual conditions. But if instead it starts with the letters IR, they can be flying in any kind of weather at very high speeds near the ground. So an IR route could be very dangerous to fly near in bad weather because these guys can be flying in bad weather at low altitudes at high speeds. Okay, also the numbering system will be helpful to you because if you see a four-digit number, that means the route is at or below 1,500 feet above ground level. But if it's a three-digit number, it could either be higher or lower than 1,500 feet above ground level. Now, the way I remember that little remembering device here is it's like a pyramid. The four-digit number is the base of it, and the three-digit number, which is smaller, sits on the top. And so the four-digit number means the route must be at or below 1,500 feet above ground level. The three-digit number means the route could actually be at any altitude. And remember, these things can be conducted in speeds in excess of 250 knots indicated airspeed. Now you have all the information you need to avoid an unwanted up-close and personal look at a military jet. So go ahead with your flying vacation and have a great trip.
As the saying goes, there are old pilots and bold pilots, but no old bold pilots. One thing that should help you become an old pilot is having an alternate airport in mind, even when you're VFR. Then, if you can't land at your destination because of fog, high winds, disabled aircraft on the runway, or whatever reason, you won't have to search frantically through your charts for a suitable airport. Here are some considerations for choosing an alternate airport. First, it should be short of your destination. It makes no sense to overfly your destination into unknown weather and geography. Ideally, it should be forecast to be VFR. It should be downwind. That forecast headwind always seems to increase when you need to go to your alternate. It should be downhill. Having to climb to reach an airport on the other side of a mountain range can really use up fuel reserves. It should have multiple runways. This helps you avoid a crosswind on landing if high winds are a factor. For IFR, it should have multiple approach aids. Navigation equipment failure is always a possibility. And finally, it should be on the same side of a weather front as your destination is. You wouldn't want to fly through that wind, rain, clouds, and turbulence again, would you? Always having an alternate in mind should increase your chances of becoming an old pilot, if not a bold pilot. Most of us know that a temperature dew point spread of five degrees or less could mean low visibility soon. But you can learn a lot more than that about your trip just by looking at these two numbers. First, you can estimate the base of cumulus clouds in thousands of feet by dividing the temperature dew point spread by 4.4. Let's assume a temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit and a dew point of 48 degrees. The spread is 22 degrees. Divide that spread by 4.4 and you'll find the base of the cumulus clouds is 5,000 feet above ground level. You don't have a calculator, just divide by 4 degrees instead and you'll still be within 10%. The same calculation will also approximate the top of the haze layer and the top of the turbulence in the haze below. Temperature alone can tell you how bumpy things will be in convective turbulence. Every 20 degree increase in temperature doubles the amount of moisture the air can hold. And the amount of moisture in the air is directly related to the amount of energy available for convection. So understanding these two little numbers could make your next trip go a whole lot smoother. With aerospace becoming more complicated and regulated, it's very important that all of us keep aware of regulation changes. Here are a few pilot updates about weather minimums, transponder requirements, and airspeed. Effective August 18th, 1990, Part 91 has been completely reorganized and renumbered. But the only significant change for most pilots is that in an airport traffic area, the speed limit for all aircraft will be 200 knots indicated airspeed. In a change to airport radar service areas that's effective December 30th, a transponder with mode C altitude reporting will be required both in and above NRSA. A recent change made night weather minimums in uncontrolled airspace the same as controlled airspace. That's three miles visibility and the appropriate clearance from clouds. One mile visibility and clear of clouds just isn't legal anymore at night unless you're in the traffic pattern and stay within a half mile of the runway. The FAA is advertising a kinder, gentler enforcement policy, but knowing these regulation changes could help you avoid putting that to the test. As conscientious pilots, all of us need to be prepared for emergencies. So let's join John as he talks about what to do if your engine quits at night and some of the things you can do to prevent engine failure. Engine failure can be a real letdown for a pilot. I know, I had a double engine failure in a twin, and to say that I was disappointed would have to be the understatement of the year. You know, actually, the catastrophic engine failure that most pilots visualize is rare. 
Much more common and the cause of my double engine failure is engine stoppage due to fuel problems. Now this is really good news in a way because you and I can do something about it. One of the things we can do is to make sure that we follow the manufacturer's instructions for draining the fuel before the flight. One of the things we're looking for is to make sure the fuel is a proper grade. 80 octane is red, 100 low lead is blue, and 100 octane is green. And if you happen to mix the uh, grades of avgas, the dyes tend to cancel and the fuel tends to turn clear. Now, that's a little bit of a problem because jet fuel is also clear, but jet fuel smells like kerosene and has an oily feel to it. And when it evaporates, jet fuel leaves an oily stain and gasoline doesn't. You also need to check for fuel contamination. One of the things you're looking for is little black particles in the fuel, and these could come from a deteriorating float or a gasket that's broken up, and they could interrupt your fuel supply. But by far the most common cause of fuel contamination is water in the fuel. If you do have water in the fuel, it'll tend to stay separate from the fuel and settle into a glob down at the bottom of the strainer. One way for water to get into the fuel is from a leaking O-ring and a fuel cap. Now, most fuel caps have two O-rings, one around the outer circumference and one at the center of the cap around the spindle. Now, frequently this inner O-ring at the center becomes worn from the opening and closing of the cap, and that can cause leaking. You can test for a leaking O-ring in your fuel cap by pouring fuel over the cap. If the fuel falls through the cap, obviously you have an O-ring that needs replacement. Now, another source of water contamination is absorption. And this is a lot more common than you might think. The problem is that water can actually be absorbed in the fuel. And the amount of water absorbed in the fuel depends on temperature. Cold fuel cannot hold as much water as warm fuel. So if you fly from a warm, moist environment to a cold environment, the water that was absorbed in the fuel can now precipitate out in the form of ice crystals, and these can interrupt your fuel supply. This is a special problem for turbocharged aircraft that fly at high altitudes, and it happened to be the exact cause of my double engine failure. When water is absorbed in the fuel, no amount of draining will eliminate it. So if you fly from warm climates to cold climates or at high altitudes, I recommend that you consider adding isopropyl alcohol or press to your fuel according to your manufacturer's recommendations. Taking these steps to ensure uninterrupted fuel to your engine just could save you the disappointment of a big letdown someday. Do engines fail at night? You bet they do. Will it happen to you tonight? In this flight? Probably not, but engines do fail. You know, pilots are fond of saying that well-maintained modern engines don't fail. But we used to teach flight instructor revalidation courses, and one of my favorite questions to ask a room full of people, very often 200 people, is do you have any experience with an engine that's failed? Have you ever had an engine fail? If so, would you please put up your hand? About half the people in the room every time would put up their hand. These are people with lots of time, and they do have engine failures. Will it happen to you? Probably not, particularly if you load the odds in your favor, because most engine failures come from pilot-induced problems, like fuel starvation. The first thing to do is do the same thing you do during the daytime. Maintain safe airspeed. Fly the airplane. Keep it under control. So set up the best glide speed. Then turn towards an airport and away from any congested areas. Now you have a dilemma. Do you go for the big, beautiful highway with lights, maybe a few cars on it, or do you go for the dark area? Well, the problem is you don't know what's in the dark area. It could be mountains, rugged terrain, or it could be, on the other hand, beautiful, smooth wheat fields. Well, the way you make this decision is to take your best guess about what's in the dark area. If you're pretty sure it's a smooth wheat field, go for it. On the other hand, you might be safer to go for that gorgeous lighted highway. Now, if altitude permits, do all the usual checks, mags, fuel, primer, anything you can do to get that engine restarted. And of course, you should always be aware of the wind direction to avoid a downwind landing. Then, tune your transponder to 7700 so they'll come looking for you. As in all emergency landings, you will in this night emergency landing eventually contact the ground. What counts is to contact the ground under control and at minimum sink rate and minimum forward speed. You'll normally get these with the flaps down. So check your operating handbook for your airplane before you get in this situation. Obviously, this is no time for you to be doing experimentation. So before you get in this situation, the next time you're out practicing maneuvers, experiment to find what configuration and speed will give you the combination of lowest sink rate and lowest speed. Now, when you're making this landing, you want to avoid 
large objects on the ground, use your landing light, turn it on, and see what you see. And as the saying goes, if you don't like what you see, turn it off again. Well, John, that segment did a pretty good job of covering emergencies. That's right, Martha, but there's one emergency that we just can't prepare people for no matter how hard we try, and it's aviation's most feared emergency. You mean an engine failure? We just talked about that, didn't we? No, no, Martha, I, I'm talking about something more serious than that. You know what I mean. It's aviation's most feared emergency. Well, John, I don't know. Why don't you tell us what aviation's most feared emergency is? Well, that's easy, Martha. It's a runaway Hobbs meter. Wow, now that's a real emergency. You know, for all pilots, there's nothing more exhilarating than a fun day of flying. When you tuck your airplane away in its tie-down spot, you're probably already thinking about that next flight. Here's a specially fun segment that will give you a few pointers to help you keep your airplane safe and ready to fly. It was one of those sticky, gooey evenings. It felt like I was wearing a cheese pizza. I was reviewing a case that looked as ugly as my ex-wife and twice as tough. It was the case of the bent tow bar. Just then, the phone rang. It was my client, a well-respected pilot. He explained his story. It sounded all too familiar. A good pilot, carefully checking out his plane, a careless moment. Well, you may already know this story. Where? Luckily, the damage was only to the plane. No one was hurt. They found the tow bar in Guatemala. So never let go of the tow bar while it's still attached to the nose gear. If you do, it could mess up your prop. Speaking of props, my special informants, John and Martha King, have a few tips on the care and feeding of your propeller. Here's our case for parking the aircraft with the prop horizontal. When the prop is horizontal, you can't walk into the arc of the prop, so if the engine accidentally fires, you'll be clear. Rain is less likely to wash grease from a constant speed prop when it's placed in a horizontal position. And if your retractable nose gear collapses when the airplane is parked, it won't damage the tip of the prop if the prop is horizontal. Third droppings won't end up on the spinner. And it's easier for the next pilot to check a horizontal prop for stone dings. It's less likely to be hit by a passing wingtip. And you need that prop horizontal to use the tow bar. Now you have the facts, so keep your prop horizontal. And remember, never let go of your tow bar while it's attached to the nose gear. Case closed. Well, that was a lot of fun. It sure was. We hope you picked up some tips that will make your flying that much more enjoyable. And you know, John, these segments were produced over a period of time, and you know what I think? No, what do you think? I think you've improved with age. Well, thank you, Martha. Thank? That's nice of you to say. Just don't let it go to your head. And all of you, now you have the right stuff judgment that comes with experience. Experience. You know, everyone always talks about experience. You know what experience is? No, John. Why don't you tell us what experience is? Well, experience is being able to recognize a mistake when you've made it again. I guess that's right. But in this case, our fellow pilots got their right stuff judgment the very best and cheapest way. What way is that? Well, the very best way to get good judgment is from someone else's experience. <laughs> well, she's right. Fellow pilots, have fun in your flying, and please, by all means, stay out of the trees. Tame this tiger. This sporty tiger can be yours. You'll love its sports car handling and spectacular visibility. Long prized for its maneuverability and surprising speed, this exciting new Tiger is in a class by itself. 
Today's new Tiger from American General provides sleek, stylish, and comfortable transportation for four. And you'll have a spectacular avionics package by Narco to match this sensational airplane. But to win, you must enter King School's newest super takeoff sweepstakes. And your order of any King course automatically enters you to win. King's exciting takeoff videos take you beyond the written. Choose from a library of 13 informative and entertaining videos, including King's newest titles, Maneuvers for the Commercial Pilot and Flight Instructor, and Night Flying. The highly acclaimed King written exam courses are always up to date and thorough, and feature super monster graphics, 3D animation, and exciting live action video to make learning easy, interesting, and fun. If you want to pass an aviation mechanics written or just want to know more about your airplane, you'll want the King Aviation Mechanics exam courses. After you've taken your King video course, let King's computerized exam review make it fun to ensure a Top Gun score. Choose questions by subject or take them all. Then receive on screen the correct answer with King's comprehensive detailed explanation. Your computer will track your progress, allowing you to select unanswered or previously missed questions. King's report card will highlight the areas you need to concentrate on to improve your score. At your option, your final exam emulates the FAA's Plato computerized testing system. King flight test courses prepare you for your check ride. An actual FAA examiner tells you what is expected for every task and your instructor shows you how to demonstrate your knowledge in the cockpit and on the ground. Order any video exam course, and you'll also receive for free King's The Right Stuff video. Beginner or seasoned pro, you'll find there's a lot to learn in this video. It covers 16 critical piloting concerns, runway illusions, flying in turbulence, nighttime emergencies, TCAs, and more. All free with any exam course order. For a better value, get your exam course, flight test course, and your choice of four takeoff videos for only $199. Or for your best value, order your exam course, flight test course, and the entire 13 Video King Takeoff Library for only $289. Phone your order in now. Call 1-800-854-1001. That's 1-800-854-1001 and win this 40 Tiger!